Tip top. Also, uh, welcome first for those I haven't met uh, and uh, had the pleasure to, uh, to shake hands. Uh, I hope that you're going to enjoy this, uh, this talk. Um, as Tobias said, uh, I'm coming from the aviation uh, business uh, on both sides. I've uh, been working on uh, electronic and software development, but also uh, uh, as an end user, as an airline pilot, actually. Uh, so this is what we're going to share together. We're going to share the experience as the guy who creates something and the guy utilizing, using uh, that thing. And um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, for those who are interested, uh, where sometimes I make some posts. Uh, this was taken um, in Memphis, uh, because what um, part of my experience is building flight simulator where you train pilots on it. And when I was at Swiss, Swiss Air and uh, Crossair, actually I've been trained on simulators in order to train for handling abnormal situations. And this picture was taken in, uh, in Memphis where I had to deploy like four uh, triple seven simulators and we'll see how those things ties up later during, uh, during the talk. So I'm going to start also with a disclaimer uh, because we might have different opinions. My employer might have a different employee uh, opinion and you might have also a different opinion and this is good. We allow to share different opinions because this is how we build a community and we become more critical about what we're doing. So, um, talking about uh, full flight simulator for those one who are not aware about what it is actually, it's a replica of a cockpit, first of all, and it's also a model, a mathematical model of everything in the aircraft. That includes the engines, the landing gear, uh, mechanism, everything is a model, mathematical model, so it relaxes exactly as the same, the same as, the, um, as the aircraft. And we use the, those simulators to train pilots, but also to train the maintenance. A simulator is designed in such a way that if you take a maintenance computer from an aircraft and you connect the maintenance computer to the uh, flight simulator, the maintenance computer doesn't see any difference. You can flush, virtually flush the toilets onto the simulator and the maintenance computer will see that there is a, a draw in current, that something is going on with some valves act, uh, acting. And um, this is one picture uh, from a real cockpit, 777 of course. <laughs> and the other one is a picture from a simulator. So you see it's really uh, one per one, uh, one per one the, the same thing. Where I got an advantage as a pilot and also a software engineer is if you take this panel, for example, that's the autopilot, the one, you know, uh, flying the aircraft where I'm doing my crosswords or sleeping or, no, not sleeping, sorry, uh, <laughs> reading newspaper, sorry, reading newspaper. Uh, the software running in that thing is the same software running in, inside the simulator. And for debugging purposes, uh, because I was the guy able to do this, I was able to actually go into the code when something was not, uh, was not correct. So, um, started really low uh, as a technician, coding software for microcontrollers, working in ADA, uh, working in assembly language, you know, the old times where you had to think about one instruction and not call a library. If you don't remember those times, that was the uh, what was the time. And most of the uh, application I was working on were on military or spacecraft. That was my first job. Uh, started in aerospace, and I say yes, that's what I want to I want to do because it's very fascinating. And what I love the most is working on complex systems. That's where you know I got the the most fun. Uh, because for me it's really a, a challenge to understand how a complex system can uh, can work. Then of course um, I saw issues into either requirements, design, implementation or whatever and I saw a little bit too much of those when I was working on such equipment and then I said well why don't you become an end user to learn more about it and I challenged myself to be an airline and this is how I just went from you know the bottom of the ladder up to the uh, <coughs> up to the uh, to the airline business. And then of course you've got the Swiss Air collapse. That's another story. And then I went back into uh, into engineering. 
Now, testers, we're using tools. Uh, along, along the path, my career path, I was able to use pretty much all those tools. And I'm still today using those tools. So some people can be quite surprised why I'm using Postman, for example, testing API. Yes, I do test API. Uh, I use Google Mirror for checking response, time response, load uh, response on, uh, on some system. So I'm, along my career, I've been able to look at different tools and many tools because I was working in different, uh, different environments. What I'm doing today? That's another interesting part. I think you know that aircraft. Who can name that aircraft here? Nobody? Oh, come on. No? No clue? This is Solar Impulse. Yes. It's Solar Impulse. And if you don't know that plane, that airplane made a trip around the globe without using a single drop of fuel. And today, I'm building electric aircraft. So we are doing in Sion, a small company called H55, with actually some guys from Solar Impulse. Uh, we are uh, trying to revolutionize the uh, aviation world by creating uh, aircraft using uh, electric propulsion. I'm hiring, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Now we're going to talk about something that I love and most of the people love as testers and also managers, dashboards. Who, using, who is using dashboard into a CI CD, for example, environment? You do, you do, everybody. Huh? You love dashboards. Why we love dashboards? Because we click on the button, very easy. You click, you press, you go. Sometimes it's automatically scheduled even at night, and then you come the next morning and you got your dashboard and everything is green. And then your manager says, it's green, yeah, we can release, fine. And then you got maybe a couple of hiccups, and then, yeah, a couple of reds here, you redo the test manually. Everybody loves that. Why? It's because it's very easy to, first of all, generate. I mean, we have like templates in the tools we are using for this, and then it's easy to connect to Jenkins or whatever. So everybody loves dashboards. But can we trust dashboards entirely when we're performing a software release? Yes, no, yes, 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 shy, yes, and no. How many no's? OK, so we kind of agree here. Forget about the disclaimer first page. <laughs> So um, I give you an example about dashboards when I was uh, working at uh, CAE, the uh, aircraft uh, flight simulator uh, manufacturer. Uh, because of whatever reason, I was called every two weeks into the VP, the, and VP and C square, you know, uh, office to make a report about testing fl uh, flight simulator. So, Every customer is a little bit different, so you have to test the flight simulator for every customer. And don't forget, we got like uh, anywhere between 20 and 50 million lines of code running on that thing, uh, plus, let's say, 35 kilometers of wires and 1 million mechanical parts. What could go wrong with that? I just let you imagine. So it's very complex to test that. And in the end, when I automated part of the test, I ended up with 900 test cases and 41,000 checks just for what I consider be basic checks on the aircraft. So here you go, you go into this meeting and then the guy asks you, okay, show me your test plan, first of all, and show me how many tests you've run. Okay, first of all, when you're building something that much complex, you always have something that could go wrong. So if I ask you, on Monday, you plan to test the API, blah, 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 and then on Tuesday, you plan, why are you late? Why? Uh, it's because maybe the database was not ready or whatever. So you, you see already that creating a test plan with dates, and you say, OK, on that date, I'm going to test this, this, and that doesn't fly that much. What doesn't fly either, neither, sorry, is how much time does it take for you to have that test green? Because sometimes you have to repeat the test like maybe two, three, four times 
because, oh, you forgot a setup somewhere or you don't have the right tool, the server is not available, the log uh, disk is full, for, for whatever reason you, you have that. And this is not shown on the dashboard. So what I, in, in the end, what I told them is say, okay, we are here as a good manager. What a good manager is, is someone removing roadblocks for teams. If you don't have such a manager, ask yourself, what is he doing here? So in short, what I was saying, the guy say, there is no way I'm going to provide you uh, a dashboard about the test on the simulator. I'm going to tell you it's going well, it's going bad, and if it goes bad, I will, need, I will tell you that I need that guy because he's not in my department, he's not under my responsibility, and I need that guy now. And this is how you can create a good atmosphere and a good relation with the management by explaining things. And if I have a manager who's just asking for a Monday morning dashboard about a release, then I'm changing manager. Or I'm trying to teach him something. So let's have an example of dashboards. Sorry. Tools who work with Test Cafe. You don't know that tool. Runner X, Kimeter, uh, Charles, Test Cafe. <laughs> okay. So you, you know, sorry, go back. Where is go back? Here. Okay, so uh, just Google it and then you find a shitload of tools. We agree on that? Why do we have different tools? Is because, like in mechanical, there are, uh, this is kind of a screwdriver, but you got a screwdriver for something. And this is why, when you look at my profile, I use so many tools. Because I use the right tool to do the right thing. Some, of, some tools are better at doing a good job, and some of us are not. Sometimes you have to combine two tools in order to achieve a good result. So, lessons learned about that. If someone tells you, do you know Renorex? And then say, oh, you don't know Renorex, I'm not going to hire you. Uh, just walk away from there. Because you're talking to someone who has a false idea about what we're talking. Automation. Automation, exactly. Most of the people today, most of the managers, they think that automation is the solution. It's not the solution, it's part of a solution. And this is why the more tools you know, the more uh, capabilities you will have to perform some task. Now, I have some electronic skills. If I tell you that I use Renorex to run some tests and at the end, of a test, if the test was okay, I got a cup of espresso. Because I connected Ranorex to an Arduino, and then the Arduino connected to the espresso machine. So if you think about that, you have a tool and then you say, what can I do with that tool? Things that in the brochure it says you can test UI. But in fact, you can test any UI. Another example was I was working in pay TV systems where I have to demonstrate that what you see on TV is about good quality. So you have a movie broadcasted, you take a snapshot of the actual TV set, the output of a TV set, and then you have to compare that image with a reference. How do you do this in automation? Does anybody know a tool for that? Who's doing pictures, photographs? Nobody? A little bit? Do you know Photoshop? No. Yeah, now you, no, okay. Do you know that you can compare two pictures with Photoshop? If you don't know, then now you know you can compare, subtract two pictures in Photoshop. So, you have a tool capable of manipulating any UI. You've got Photoshop, you take picture one, picture two, you subtract, if everything is dark, then you know that you don't have any problem of uh, TV quality. And if you're curious, when you compress a dark image with a few white spots, because it's JPEG, the weight of the image is going to be extremely tiny. So this is how you come with something totally unrelated, but you use some 
tricks and back holes in order to have the result you're looking for. Bottom line, as a tester, be curious about everything. Everything you can put your hand on it, put your hand on it. So I just hired you. Thank you for joining my new, uh, my new company. And you're working on a company uh, designing a website. And uh, it's for leisure trips. And uh, one of the things we're trying to promote is, of course, honeymoon trip. Because, you know, those guys, when they're just getting married, they got plenty of money to spend. And we would like their business. So the uh, requirement, if I can say so, is we take a random picture from our database and then we put honeymoon on it. And then I'm asking you to test it and better because I want a fast delivery. I would like you to automate that test. So you all know the trick. We go with a tool and then we can look at the HTML code and then say, yeah, if I found that tag, test is good. I'm going to have a red mark on my uh, dashboard. We agree, Tobias? Depending on the tool. Depending on the tool, exactly. So if you don't know what your tool is capable of using this, then it's OK. Yeah. With another picture, it's not OK. So this is where, even if you have the impression that the automation say it's OK, it's not. And how you can prevent those things to happen, first of all, by knowing the tool you're using, the capabilities of a tool, understanding the requirement, and maybe sometimes just use the application yourself. Honeymoon's still there. You all have handies and things like that, huh? Not everybody is old like me, wearing glasses, set up in Android, and then uh, increase the uh, text size. <laughs> That's a killer. <laughs> so just for, just for illustration, I, um, I have to read a lot of documents on the aircraft. And uh, I, I put my screen in portrait. You know, most people, they, they love to have like six windows where you got Jenkins, then you got Jira, and then blah, blah, and blah, blah. Your email, and then YouTube, and the classics. <laughs> uh, but me, I need to read a, a lot of things. So I put a second screen in, in portrait. And then it's funny what you can see in, the, in portrait is uh, <clears throat> sometimes I want to touch some pictures. So this is what you have when you open the default Windows application uh, on portrait. How user-friendly is that? You see, I'm interested in picture, actually. I'm not interested in the sliders and everything. That could be there, yes. But the main goal is for me to see the result on the picture. And then, of course, you got this when we, when we talk about this, this thing. When you increase the size of a font, it doesn't display. Again, if we use automation, depending on automation we use, the text will be found. But for an end user, it's going to be a pain in the neck because he doesn't have what he wants to have. Uh, just before the, uh, the presentation, the talk, I had an interesting discussion about what, in fact, are we doing? Are we testing or are we checking? Then I will go a little bit offside the record here. I won't ask for the camera to be turned off, but is someone here willing to say or try to explain what the difference in between testing and checking? If you see a difference, you want? Yes, so <laughs> checking is, yeah, the test lab, it says verify that or check that uh, label X is displayed and you take it, yes, it's correct or not. And testing is using the application looking for problems and hopefully finding, finding problems. Okay. Does someone else have another explanation or something to share? No? Don't be shy. Come on. We're just like family here. Yeah, go. Yeah, testing is also probably a little bit to check boundaries. So what can the dumbest user do to the application? and? Uh, 
um, what can I enter in this field and will the application crash and, and stuff like that. So Correct. Nothing that the scenario really described. Correct. So now you can see where we trapped ourselves as a tester community because we say we have automated tests. We got test automation where actually we have automated checks and then you've got this big story depending on which conference you go where you have no I'm a manual tester uh, I got whoa, 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 wait a second what, what is a manual tester so people now starting arguing about manual versus automation etc etc and I think you you got the good approach in your in your new work uh, where when you want to release a, a product from my point of view again and you can disagree you must have a mix of both you must automate something that you need and can be automated so you got like yeah for me it has a certain standard and then perform manual checks on it manual tests on it so you can push the system in something different in a different area that was not explored and then of course you've got exploratory testing and then you can measure also things that dashboard don't measure how you measure usability you have a dashboard for this so you got this a perfect UI and then when you click the button is here the next button is there etc that's usability do you have a tool for measuring this yes kind of if we use a tool which is a, a, a mix of checking inside the HTML context uh, page content sorry and also a tool which take for example a snapshot and then able to compare a snapshot so as a manual tester you check yes the uh, pop-up is here and then next time is still there and then maybe you put a mask because the data are changing but you see where I'm going I'm going to the point where most of the tools we're using are just producing automatic checks on a, on a, on a dashboard and then all those things is hidden. Why? It's because it's easy. It's very easy to measure blue, white, present, not present, error message. The other stuff, usability, hmm, it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder and we don't have any metric. How you define usability? Define usability it's easy to use yes okay I'm blind is it easy to use uh, no okay I'm colorblind. blind is it is you? so you see already we have a problem putting a measure a scale on usability so that's why the tendency for people is to <laughs> forget it let's walk away from this because it's too hard but this is also part of the tag the, the price value of, a, of, a, of your product it's your branding which is which is there also. So again, when you just check for you know a, a quick response, you can write any code you want in Java or Python, whatever. But we're checking for something which is present, not present, and that's fairly uh, fairly easy, fairly easy to do. Um, I told you about being curious, and I recommend you to read that book if you have not. Um, Daniela, I'm asking you this question. I'm out in the space, about 100 kilometers away from Earth. I have a stake in my hand. And then I threw out of, uh, out of the window. Will it hit the Earth's surface frozen or cooked? Frozen because it's extremely cold up there and then the temperature changes so we're talking about minus 80 90 more or will it be cooked because when it entered dense area of the atmosphere it will start to heat up i would say cooked but no idea actually okay anyone else want to try this one i'll tell you the same you need more information you need more information Someone else? I would say for it being cooked, it's too slow. But frozen, I'm not sure. Okay, you know why? What? You all right. Everybody is right here. Why? Is because you have already started a process thinking about it. This is the difference between a tester that will take 
something and say, yeah, it's blue, it should be blue, it's okay, it's blue, and then uh, it's okay or, or not okay. When we are confronted to situations that we don't know, we have to establish a theory that we can validate thereafter as a tester. And this is a big difference between a pure tester and someone who does checks. So this book is super funny. Uh, the guy is very, very good at it. And he will drive you into areas <laughs> where you have no clue. And, he, and when you look at it, the guy has worked at NASA, uh, does all kind of calculation. And I can tell you a bridge made out of Lego from London to New York doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, second version came out. Yeah. 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 You read the first one? Yes. And? Uh, it's brilliant. Brilliant. So be curious, and that's one way of training your mind to have situations that you don't know and try to figure out what could be the solution to it, even if you're not skilled at it, but at least you have this process. Some people ask me why I quit flying. Uh, I don't want to answer that. Um, but what I do is I still fly uh, simulators, combat simulators, because I worked on a military aircraft before. And those simulators, they have uh, mission capabilities. So actually, you're fighting with an AI against other, uh, other opponents. And why I love to do this is because when you are in the cockpit alone with your weapons and communication and everything, you have to take snap decision that could turn the battle into pass or fail. And this is what I do for, you know, on a weekend. So I'm training myself, Tobias. <laughs> I'm training myself uh, to be put into a situation where I have different source of information and I need to take a decision quick. And that's something you can find into games and other games like this. So you, you train your brain in two different things, decision making and also curiosity. So we spoke about things like it's complicated versus complex and why we're walking away from things which are complex because we don't understand them. Usability is like uh, hard to define. Just to give you an example, this is the forces which are in effect when an aircraft takes off. So you see there are curves everywhere. Now if I ask you to write different test cases about this, some of us will have a lot of trouble just by reading the numbers. And this is what I called in, uh, in, in, in testing environment the butterfly effect. Sometimes you're testing an application where you got just a GUI, and then you GUI, you got an API, then an API, you got a database somewhere, then you got a server, and then you got a log mechanism, and then at the end you got a, a billing mechanism, and then you got custom. So you see, we can quickly uh, go into a, a, a complex system. As a tester, usually we are just looking at one application, or you testing this GUI, you testing this API layer. Who has the full picture? You do in your case because? Sometimes, uh, probably because you do end-to-end -end <coughs> tests uh, with the business together. Development. Okay. You really have an end-to-end -end picture, I guess. And yeah. Full picture because you have the business side, you have the development side, and you have really the whole flow from from the starting point till whatever is down in your system, a database or whatever. Who is in the audience confronted to uh, testing a system where it just tests like a small part of it? Everybody tests end-to-end. -end. So that's good because then you're really representing the end user. So you know the tool a little bit better. Uh, you know the architecture. Usually you know the architecture of a system. So you can uh, create or create scenarios where you say, what if I do this? What's, uh, what should happen? In some companies, it's the opposite. Uh, you test the GUI, you test the API, you test the server, etc., etc. And if you don't have an extra layer on top, of testers doing end-user, 
management will be prone to say, well, this thing is green, dashboard, this thing is green, dashboard, this thing is green, so you release. So the butterfly effect in my case is when you take off, uh, for example, you take engine from uh, air from the engine in order for you passengers to be cool. Okay? Some people, they walk into the airplane, they start shaking, they don't feel comfortable at all. And this is why we're putting air conditioning on, so they feel uh, very cool. But <clears throat> this is how it, it, it works now. If you take air for the air conditioning, then you reduce thrust, because that's the air that's supposed to push the aircraft. If you reduce thrust, then you have a longer uh, takeoff distance. If you have a longer takeoff distance, then you use more fuel. If you use more fuel when you climb, then you're climbing faster, etc., etc., etc. So if you're just working on the air conditioning system and the guy is not very familiar with the air conditioning system, if he looks at it and says, yeah, instead of drawing, I don't know how many cubic meters per minute, then I take double, for him, it doesn't mean a lot. But for the whole system, it means a lot. So what is the conclusion of that is if you are in a company where you don't have access to or you're not involved into the end-to-end -end testing, try to get acquainted with other teams and other parts of the system so you have a better knowledge about what you're doing and where you can have pitfalls into your, into your application. Test, so that's where testing systems of system is getting complicated. Who's doing tests on, let's say, Windows system or Linux? You do. So are you testing a system or are you testing a system of systems? I guess most of the time it's system of systems because it's different applications that work together. So I would classify that as system of systems. Okay. Over... Other thing, what window is? Windows, you know, all windows. What is it? We call that an operating system. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, what do you call Linux? Operating system. Okay, so everybody here, without really noticing it, is already testing a system of system. Uh, who's working multi thread? Multi-threaded, okay. CPU affinity, concurrent uh, resources between threads. Okay, so you're testing this maybe on your computer or maybe on a VM. Hardware servers, actually. So, yeah, but sometimes also on, on VMs, depending. But yes, okay. it's also system of systems, of course. So we're using VMs, for example, in, in our case, and I'm not really point, finger, finger pointing at you, but we're using a VM, okay? We're using a VM which is supposed to represent like a real computer. How can you guarantee that, for example, all the real-time events in that VM are going to occur at really the desired time? So your application will perform always good. And we can push the concept a little bit more is if you test on your computer and you got, I'm a developer, I love to have 60 gig of memory and like the latest CPU. What about the guy uh, having like a Pentium 2, 2.6 megahertz and eight gig of RAMs? Single core. So again, we can have some test scenarios saying yes, if you're working with complex application, complex operating, not even complex operating system, just operating system, you can land in an area where, oh, because I don't have that patch, this system is not working. Because I don't have that driver, this system is not working. So this, this is why I'm really against dashboards, because the dashboard don't tell everything. You tested, you checked in a certain configuration. Now, because you're a smart tester, smart checker, then you can say, presumably, yes, it's going to work in, an, in, a, in a different environment, but maybe it will not. 
But based on your experience, you have this capability of saying, yes, we can deploy the, the, uh, the delivery, the product on another one. But doesn't that make it difficult for the management? If I as a tester approach them and say, yeah, based on my experience, I know that it will work in those circumstances because I tested it specifically in that setup, and it might work for other customers as well, but I cannot give you the answer because I didn't test it. That, that, that is good that you bring this in, you know, on a table, Tom, uh, Tobias, because when I was at CAE, this is the thing I had to establish with the management. You have to position yourself as a tester to be a resource, uh, uh, the person to go uh, by the management. Instead of exposing dashboard, they come to you and ask questions about how risky, for example, it is, how long it will take. And this relationship takes time to build because then you can still talk about dashboard and then you can prove them wrong by founding another bug say, well, it was not covered, first of all, by a test case. And second of all, it's not, uh, it's not directly linked to a direct requirement. Usually, you, you know, as a user, when I click in this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then you have, if you refresh the page, for example, maybe the information is lost. It, the requirement is not present. So what did you prove? You proved that. You push the test to a limit where if you use the application in that way, then you will have a problem. And then they start believing that, OK, the guy knows about it. So they can trust you after a while saying, what's your gut feeling about it? Yeah, just to learn the hardware, I mean, when we, when we started test results, we didn't have a dashboard exactly for that reason, because there is no sense in it. Can you imagine the first question that everybody asked when we demonstrated the tool? Do you have a dashboard? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Of course. And I guess everybody is in the same situation. It's like if there are five tests that have a dashboard that present the information like it's green, red, or yellow, and you come there and they, hey, we need to have an, an a talk. <laughs> yeah. It just makes it a bit hard. So are there any, any, any real life tips on actually how to convince management that that is the fast forward? Um, how I, I'll come to you. I try to recall how I did it. Uh, I think I put my life at risk when I did it. Uh, because when he asked for dashboards, I just, he was a C-level. <laughs> I just said, no, I'm not going to give you any dashboard, man. Uh, that's pretty much, that was my, uh, my answer. And then I told, I explained him that if he wants to have a clear status about this simulator in particular, I can tell him yes, no, and my I engage my responsibility towards that. And that's how I, I start building trust. And lucky for me, in the 10 years I, I've been on triple, I never had a situation where I was wrong. So, you know, it takes some, uh, I would say, some guts uh, to go up front and tell them, well, what, in fact, yes, this is maybe the trick. Uh, management is always money. Yeah? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? I give you an example. I worked in a company. We were rushed to create a product that turned out to be extremely shitty. But why? Why would someone put a product on the market that is shitty? It's still better as a competition than a competition. Competition, niche market, patent sometimes. So you see, it goes way out of our scope and the things we know. So if you establish this relationship with the management, say, OK, what is your goal? What do you want? What do you care? What your customer care? Then you can focus on what needs to be done. And then you can even agree on areas of testing. It might be worth for them to say, I want this fi fi uh, sorry, feature to work and disregard the other is going to be for the next one. But I want to attract new customer because of that feature. And that could be a way to trigger the discussion between testing and management in an interactive way. dashboard then the management has the feeling that there is no risk left exactly and maybe now that's what you wanted to say right 
Chris? No. Chris, the approach? Yeah, yeah, partially, yes. But um, I also wanted to say that that only works if you're uh, kind of experienced and know what you're doing and have knowledge about. Because if you're new in the area and you still have to learn about that. That is correct. For example, then this probably doesn't work and then the dashboard helps to at least say, okay, we did at least these checks and after some time, when you get, um, when you get uh, the knowledge, then you really can go to the management and say, hey, uh, next time we don't use any dashboards anymore, <laughs> just ask me how it works. Yeah, and it's even worse if you're a consultant because most of the time, you know, uh, we hire uh, testers as consultants and we're just sitting there, you know, we got our consultant office and um, sometimes we don't even have a badge to enter. We have to ask for a badge every morning, uh, things like that. So, yes, yeah, that is really non, not comfortable at all, uh, especially when you're a consultant to come to your customer and say, well, you know, OK, listen to me. Um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't work. So I, I understand that part, uh, but everybody can try to find a way, and especially when you're gaining, when you're gaining experience, be more comfortable uh, with this. Okay, um, so the company we were working before for the website, we went bankrupt, I'm sorry, uh, but I started a new company, and uh, now we make, we're making uh, artificial horizon for uh, big jets. So we got a contract, we know, with uh, Swiss, and uh, we're creating uh, this instrument that I use a lot for flying into, uh, into the clouds. Eh? You know that also? Yeah. So you have to try to keep as much blue and as much brown as possible because otherwise it's, uh, it's not good. So you're making this, uh, this instrument also. We're making this instrument. And when we fly, <coughs> when we got to a certain angle, so if the aircraft is a little bit too much nose up like this, you've got chevrons showing up. Those chevrons are going to tell you, hey, guy, the earth is down there, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Safe. <laughs> Up, heaven, not good, okay? We don't want to meet God today, maybe tomorrow. And the same thing happen if you're two nose down, you're going to have chevrons showing up where the sky is. Easy cheesy, so I let you think about the lines of code that you're going to write into um, C sharp, whatever, to have it. And then we're going to trade the test cases for this. Okay, so I see your face, you're thinking, okay, nose up, shove on down, nose down, shove on over direction. Everybody happy? Okay. Dashboard? What is the color of the dashboard? You know, the dashboard from Jenkins, whatever. Everything is green. Ah. I'm proud of you guys, thank you. We're going to have a party because you did a great job. And then I have to announce you something, is that um, we won a contract worth of several millions with the uh, Arma Suisse, and they're going to install our equipment on jets. Let's celebrate. And it's good because our product, everything is green. Okay. Someone is nodding here in the audience. You're cool, guys. We can ship. There is no, tr there is no trick. There is no trap here. You can test when you fly upside down. Oh, cool. OK. That's a major difference between a big jet and a fighter jet. It flies upside down. Now, we're going to do an interactive exercise together, if you feel so. You feel so? Okay, so you realize that this thing is pointing towards the ground or towards, towards the sky. Now you're going to close your eyes and listen to my voice. And then you're going to tilt your head back until you reach what is approximately azimut, which is 90 degrees up. Okay, you're like this. And then you're going to try to figure out where the shortest way close to earth or sky is, so you can put your sky pointer. Okay, so if you are 90 degrees, exactly 90 degrees, first of all, the chevron, they cannot appear. Ah, oh, funny, eh? And now, if you're a fighter pilot, 
swirling your aircraft in the air and that thing keeps going up, down, up, down because you're close to 90 degrees, you're going to be distracted while there is a missile coming at you. Okay? What's the story behind? The story behind is as tester, we almost always check into static conditions. Where is the dynamic of a system? API, send that request. Next. API, CRUD, you know, create, uh, read, update, delete, ah, the classic, and then we try the other fields. And we try all kinds of things without having, most of the time, a complete scenario representing the real life. We went bankrupt just because of that bug, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm very, you know, I got money, I got investors in my back. So now, we're creating a company which makes like, navigation system for cars. And we are very lucky because the company is very close to Schwitz. <sighs> and uh, this is our market. So uh, we, we solve that. I'm sure you guys have tested everything on that thing, including navigation. So if you want to go there, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. Everybody happy? Dashboard is green. green, yeah. I got great news. We're selling to Australia. Are you going to ship? No, not, not you, not you. No, no, no. You don't answer that one. Someone else. Are you going to ship? Yes or no? Yes. Yes? Yes? Okay, who said no? Why? Because it's not an environment. They have other streets, they have, I'm not even sure if they drive on the, on the left or on the right side, uh, so stuff like that. Is that's a good point. Eh? You know when you're in your car, usually the OK button is on the left of a screen. Why? It's because you're driving OK, cold, blah, blah, uh, horn, colder, warmer. Okay, the OZ is very driving on the other side of the road, guys. So if the button OK is on the left, for them it's like stretching to get it. And you're right, because they're driving on the other side, inside the car, they're all seen driving on the other side of the road. Meaning that when they take a roundabout, they don't take a roundabout like that. So, Next time your manager asks you, okay, we've got this customer we're going to sell, all our dashboard is green, try to inquire who they sell to, what they sell. Because despite the fact that all the dashboard is green, you might end up into troubles with that customer. What if, what if, what if, what if, all the time. So we spoke, we touched base about things which are uh, hard, to, uh, hard to measure, like usability, maintainability, uh, repairability, database goes down. Who's the guy able to, usually the guy is always on vacation. You haven't noticed when you got a database down, the, the only guy who knows the script, what script to run, is not here. That's a nightmare. So, <laughs> but data is money, okay? So we all aware about this. If we don't have something in place that's part of maintainability, uh, then it's time to act on it. If you're working with Cucumber, I think that's the tool, uh, you can specify your requirement, then you have some tests uh, around it. As a user, I want to place item in a basket. And I don't know, for most of you, you've seen when you put things in the basket, the basket change colors. Sometimes you get the number of items. But in case you don't have a number of items, the, uh, the basket is changing color. Yeah, that's fine. 
I'm blind caller. I'm called a blinded user. So what? We just forgot these, uh, those guys? You wrote as a user. You didn't specify as a normal user. This is called segregation. You can be sued, especially in the States. If you disregard some part of the population, you can be sued in the States. So again, here, when you create requirement and when you see requirement, you have to also understand the intention of a requirement, not only on a technical point of view, but also by triggering the discussion with management, understanding where the company wants to go, the kind of population, etc., etc. The more information you have, the better you are at testing. So it's not just looking at requirements, it's just understanding the full picture, complex environment. You're working on a, on, on a scheduling tool. Uh, people might work at night with that tool, especially because they're doing the repair at night. Would you come with a UI with a white background? At night, you're just blind. So if I work in such an environment where I know that the users are going to use my, my tool into a dark environment, I will try to adjust the colors, the font, and everything. Could be the lighting also, kind of light source they're using. If you use purple, uh, maybe that font with purple light, uh, whatever, will turn red. You don't know. Subjective. It ties up also with the fact that we hate to, uh, to go with uh, easy things to, to measure. Um, I have one test case into the, one of the test cases into the simulator. <clears throat> so you are on the simulator, you're taking off, and then suddenly a, a tire blows. Okay, we'll do the same exercise. You picture yourself in, in your car for those having a car. Okay, yes, that's what I figured out, okay. Um, you have, uh, you're driving on a highway, and you know, you're cool. You, you're a cool person, you have hands off the wheel. Then your tire, let's say left front tire blows, and then you do nothing except pressing on a pedal brake. What if, you remember this thing? What if, what if? So picture yourself and try to think what could happen. I'll leave you a couple of seconds. So we blew the front right tire, okay? Okay, you have your mindset? Okay, this is what I think is going to happen. First of all, your car will have a tendency to go to the right because you got more friction on the right side. Then when you press the brake, this thing is going to increase. So you will have a tendency to turn even further. And if you press enough the brakes, then you will end up maybe 90 degrees to the right. And you might notice that your stopping distance that you used to see with all the tires is going to be longer. We just talk here about subjective things. You agree? We said it should turn right. How many degrees? <laughs> no clue, man. Uh, how long it will take to stop? <laughs> Why are you asking me? This is one test I have to demonstrate to the authority. Can you imagine that? And the way it is written in their requirements, it says, well, blah, 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 has to be representative. Don't <laughs> what it want me to do with that. Okay? And then I had the issue where I was coming with a captain from Emirates who said, yeah, I got that. And then the whole thing just went there and the other one, oh, no, doesn't do it. How can you test this? Well, the only way I found was to use automation. I use automation to set up the aircraft in always known condition, mastering all the parameters that could get there, performing the operation, having myself sitting in the cockpit and say, yeah, it looks good. Nobody would 
have been able to tell me it's correct or it's not correct, but at least I have a baseline. You see? So sub it goes from something totally subjective, you establish a baseline, and then you can tune that baseline. Then I can ask the guys from flight or from, uh, yeah, from flight, the flight group, to increase, for example, the friction, the drag on the tire or something like this. So we have something more representative. And it turns out that before this is the test procedure, yes? Sorry for asking questions, but did you also simulate this in the real world sometimes? I Me, I never had a tire exploding. Okay. Uh, one of my friends had a tire exploding and ended up into the engine, which was not good. So we got like two more failures to simulate. Too complicated. <laughs> um, but this was the original test procedure when I took the, uh, the responsibility for the 777. You see, there is nothing in there. Just increase the speed, blow the tire, and then say it's okay or it's not okay. Well, how do you want me to put pass or fail here? Um, by the way, uh, when I test the simulators, I have to put my signature uh, with the authority on it, stating that the aircraft behaves exactly as the, um, as the aircraft. And if there is like something which is not trained properly because there is a defect, I can go to jail. That gives you about an idea about you know, the responsibility you have when you test such a, such a thing. So putting my signature in there was for me like, eh, yeah, well. So what did the Alex guy did? Well, 777 did say, okay, I want to master all the conditions. This is now the new script. You reposition to Geneva, whatever, you have to set then you have to think about what could impact the measurement, the slope, the, if there is water on the runway, because we simulate water, uh, the center of gravity of the aircraft, the thrust, everything. Then when you master all the uh, elements of the equation, you execute a test, and then you have something that you can repeat. So I don't know if it's right or wrong, but at least I had a baseline for something which was totally subjective. Not bright enough? Well, if someone told me it's not bright enough uh, because I use also hardware equipment, I will take something for measuring light. So, okay, that number of lumens or whatever. And then when the guy complains again, say, so, <laughs> last time you say 6.5, it's still 6.5, so shut up. Now we're going to the uh, crunchy uh, test. I'm running late, eh? It's okay for you? Okay. Oh, that aircraft, a beauty. Doesn't cut that much. Well, at least the uh, American, they say like 425 million, that's a bargain. Uh, that's, by the way, the aircraft make it. We're not talking about a missile. A missile is about 250,000. So when you got six of them, you see the prices go up and actually. So here we go. Those guys are flying Raptors. America first, Switzerland second. Sorry. And they're going from, uh, I don't remember if it was Narita to Hawaii or vice versa. But, okay, those babies are flying. And suddenly, Suddenly, the whole cockpit goes blank. No more navigation, just basic communication, nothing. Now, of course, it's a flying computer, mm -hmm. this thing. Does someone know what this red line is in the middle of the screen? Does someone believe in time travel? You, yep? I don't believe in time travel, but uh, well, you can do it if you cross this line because it's the date change in, how do you call it? Yeah, you go, you you go backward one day, yes. or you go forward one day. Okay, what's going to happen to some application using time as a reference to, let's say, um, keep track of uh, transactions? Okay, you got an API, you got a server, and then say, oh, I received that query, blah, blah. <laughs> You see where I'm going with that? This is exactly what happened to those guys. When they crossed the line, the time changed by a full day, and then all the computers, they went banana. So why are they even using local time and not just TTC? 
because UTC changes also. So that's, this is where you got the problem is because the date is also changing for most of the computer, they changing a full day. So when you're flying with this, when I'm about on that side, if I look at my computer, it will tell me I'm going to revive tomorrow. And then when I cross the line, then the thing is going to be uh, updated on my flight management computer. But it's just to see, to show you that because we're working in Northern Hemisphere, we're working in Switzerland when we don't have such problem, we're not exposed to it. And most of the bugs, they're coming from this, like an aircraft going upside down when they went to the Southern uh, Hemisphere. They were lucky because those aircraft have a limited range for fuel and they had some uh, fuel tankers and they saw the fuel tankers. It was day. They were able to follow the fuel tankers to go back to the base. How much for this one? That was just 200 million direct costs. We're not talking about the impacts on the uh, uh, research that could have been uh, done uh, out of this, uh, out of this uh, probe. So it was Mars Climate Orbiter uh, designed to go over Mars and study the, uh, the, the atmosphere, if you wish. So they tested, and God know how much they test the hardware into aerospace. Why? Because uh, pressing on the reset button is not like really possible. Um, they tested the software, of course, of it. They tested all the navigation system and everything. So I would like you to memorize that formula. It's okay, good. Dashboard. Dashboard is green. Let's fire it up. So what happened is, of course, if, if, if you want to throw a probe in, towards a planet, the planet is not in front of you. I think you, you know that because you know they are rotating. So even the Earth is rotating, and depending on the time, you're going to throw it in another. So it's very, very complex to throw that thing at the right time so it hits the, uh, the target. So of course, what you have to do you have to change the trajectory of the object by using the thrusters. So from time to time you give a burn here and then it changed direction and everything. That thing ended up crashing on Mars. Someone has an idea why? Sorry. Yep. Some people were using the metric systems while the others were using imperial system. And of course, both systems, they work in their context. And this is how they lost this probe because the navigation, I don't recall exactly, but let's say the navigation was working in imperial and the correction were done in metric. Green, always, it's always green. ASEAN Airline, but one of the last one of the last one and then I'm setting you free guys. So you saw before, on a triple seven everything was tested. It was tested by engineering. It was tested by the FAA. It was tested by different people, even the airline themselves. And we ended up with this accident, which broke my heart uh, because it was the first accident really for 777 that has been in service for many years, since 1996 or 98, without any uh, life loss. Never had uh, uh, an accident on, on that one. And um, so uh, the story is that they came for landing in San Francisco and it's like, a, you know, a plane is like a car. You got some automation which helps you like the cruise control or things like that, that helps you, you know, driving uh, the camera when you want to park and everything. So we use those kind of things because we want to be concentrated on the approach and have, uh, you know, the easy thing done by automation. 
those guys, they ended up using a part of the automation which for my test was not very well designed. And I bumped into that, uh, into that story five years before the accident. That's one of my posts you can find on uh, professional forums. Um, I was trying this, so I was flying in a simulator and then suddenly I bumped into that thing and you know when you know the whole aircraft, the philosophy of the aircraft and then you see something which is like uh, okay, but it, it, it doesn't stick together. You see, it, it smells it smells bad. So I went to, to probe the community and say, well, something is not correct. And in the end, I decided to send something to Boeing to say, well, I checked the code, I checked the requirement, everything was implemented as per design. So you cannot say it's a bug, per se. You can say it looks weird, because usually we call a bug like something that doesn't work against, uh, against one requirement. And um, it sat there because Boeing just reported to me, well, you know, it's designed like this, approved like that, then it's working like this. Five years later, those guys ended up into that bug. So what I'm getting to is sometimes we can have some frustration where we say something is not working right and then the management or whoever is coming against your will saying, no, but that's fine. In the end, did I felt guilty about that one? Yes, for a moment. It took me time to say, well, you've done what you should have done and sad for, for the people. And I think for testers, that's something also we can do. We have to choose our battles. We can say, this is not working, this is not perfect. And if someone you know, with uh, big stripes and uh, big money says, ah, that's the way it is, we have to accept it. But that's pretty tough to do at the very beginning, especially when you're not an experienced, uh, an experienced tester. Uh, we talk about this thing, but I hate the most is, uh, you, you, you know, I'm not very fluent in uh, Swiss German or German at all. So sometimes I land into a page and then I start filling out the page. General terms of condition, all in German. Okay, so I want to change, pop, go on a menu and then switch to English and then, huh, my formula disappear. How frustrating is that? Part of a user experience, part of something which is hard to measure because it's subjective. I will quickly go through this one. Um, we talk about this butterfly effect. When I automated the test, for example, this panel on the 737, I used to manipulate one switch and then check for all the other lights because you never know, it could be a wiring problem, it could be a software problem. Most of the time what we do, we click OK and then we say OK, we click OK and then the other page appeared. But we don't check everything, we don't even check if something from the present page was still, uh, was still here. So this is, in order to cover uh, my, uh, my job, uh, what I force myself to do is every time I perform an action and I know that it could have a ripple effect, I check somewhere else. That's what I could call today a, a best practice, at least for me. We talk about system of system, how complicated they are to test. Uh, this is something I love, and especially uh, item number seven. So communication is really key in our job as testers. And this is why I have a bad habit of smoking, but I can tell you I met a lot of different people from different departments because we, there is always someone who has a very small uh, bad habit. Coffee is a good one also. Um, the more you discuss with people, the more you know about the company, the way they work, the product they want to, uh, they want to have. The conclusion of this is, as a pilot, this is what I see about the electric system into a 777. This is what the maintenance guys see when they look at it. This is how Boeing sees it when they design it. And this is how the electrical team <laughs> sees it. So we are pretty much end users of a solution and we see just tip of the iceberg knowing how it's implemented deeply, knowing some technology is key 
so we can learn about performing better tests on what we're doing.